The Jameson Thompson Weatherford Building opened on June 20th, 1930, and is located in West 3rd and Oak Street in historic downtown Texarkana. The Jameson Building is named after Dr. G.U. Jameson Sr., an ambitious and driven doctor who had a goal to be a cornerstone in his community, seeing it lacked decent medical care. He was originally from Mississippi, but received his college education from the University of Illinois. He moved to Texarkana by way of Clarksville in 1906 to set up his medical practice. By the late 1920s, Jameson had another idea for the community. He wanted to build a large professional building where people could have spaces to open retail shops and provide various services to the community. This building would be owned and operated by African Americans. His business partners were Dr. W.T. Thompson and fellow Dr. W.A. Weatherford, a funeral director. The construction of the Jameson Thompson Weatherford building was underway in 1929. The 12,000 square foot building's construction cost $60,000, which was a great expense to the African American community. But as you know, they got it done. The contractor and other workers were all African American except the white electrician since there were no African American licensed electricians at that time. The building was a huge success, kicking off a grand opening gala celebration. This building housed many movers and shakers in the African American community, as well as everyday residents who needed a place to socialize, buy necessities, and services. The building became a center of economic, cultural, and social life in the city's African American community. The Great Depression was devastating to the Jameson Thompson Weatherford Professional Building. The co owners had to pull out of the business and the financial burden of the building was solely on Dr. G.U. Jameson Sr. The building was the heart of commercial activity in the African American community through the 40s and 50s. Dr. G.W. Jameson Sr. put a lot of effort and love into the operation of this building for his people and the community. It was because of what the building symbolized to the black community and to his father that Dr. G.U. Jameson Jr. took over after his father's death in 1951 to preserve and maintain ownership of the building in hopes that the vitality and inspiration will one day be renewed. The community of Macedonia was founded in 1873 by Garrett Briley and his large family. The community's namesake was taken from its flagship church, Macedonia Baptist Church. The community came about when Briley arrived in Bowie County, Texas, by way of the job as a freight handler for Pacific Railroad. As more job opportunities for former slaves came about, more and more families moved into this thriving community. The design of the Macedonia School building, as well as this educational system, was established by the Tuskegee Institute up north, led by Booker T. Washington. Built on donated land, Macedonia School graduated its first class in 1925. Despite a lack of financial support from the county school board, the school provided students with quality education and found various ways to make ends meet. However, after World War II, families began relocating to the area in order to work at the brand new Red River Army Depot and the Lone Star Ammunition Plant. The last class to graduate from Macedonia School was in 1969. Today, the Macedonia campus is now the Liberty Allo School of Success. It is used to teach special need children, troubled youth, and those interested in continuing their education. It is a part of the Liberty Allo School District in Texarkana, Texas. Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, Texarkana, Texas. I have a five-part presentation I'd like to uh, share with you this evening. My name is uh, Tony Patterson, pastor, New Baptist Bible Fellowship, president of the Dunbar Alumni Association. I was asked to uh, do a 
topic concerning Old Dunbar High School that is located at 10th between Apple and Plum Streets in Texarkana. The first location uh, of Dunbar High School uh, occurred around uh, the year 1880 when the Negro population had grown in Texarkana, Texas to the point that it was right for the establishing of a school for our children. Uh, this is a very uh, transitional time for uh, Texarkana. It was growing. Uh, people were moving in. It was uh, part of the great diaspora. Uh, a lot of uh, black people were moving north, but also a lot of uh, people uh, were moving into uh, larger towns. Uh, and by the way, uh, it is located... Uh, where the site of the Sands Motel is right now. Uh, second part of uh, this segment uh, is the name. The first name of this school was Central. Uh, and it remained the name of uh, the school until 1916. Thirdly, the name change uh, to Dunbar uh, was changed to Dunbar after the popular African-American poet of the time named Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Dunbar relocated to this location into a relatively thriving community at the time called Rose Hill that was uh, made up of black folks with businesses and various professionals. But in 1968, there came down a mandate from the United States Supreme Court in a ruling in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, which in essence proclaimed throughout the land that segregated schools were unconstitutional and existing as separate but equal institutions and were to close or rather assist and desist immediately, or so we thought, immediately. Turns out that we, uh, we integrated a year earlier than our competition, Marshall, Tyler, Longview, those schools, even the Crosstown rivals of Washington High, they stayed another year. But we, uh, we went to Texas High. Uh, this meant that Dunbar and all secondary schools, K-1 through 12, must close. And all the students would then enroll and attend Texas High or the prevailing area elementary school at the beginning of the 1968-69 school year. But this part, uh, this paragraph that I'm emphasizing now must never be left out of our history. And that is that she almost was permanently closed. Set aside and fenced up as a storage warehouse. Uh, Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education sent a representative down here after this public outcry. He came down and he toured uh, Dunbar, just a little bit on the inside, but mostly on the outside. It wasn't very long. He said, okay, I've seen enough. And uh, after that, uh, it came down that uh, it would be turned into an elementary school. Uh, lastly, the current disposition, and that is she is open and serving. Although Dunbar High School is no longer our beloved high school, she is still lauded and loved because she is still open and serving. Texarkana is known for one eating establishment that probably has been forgotten about in the past decade. And that institution was the Polar Bear Cafe. As I reflect back, the Polar Bear Cafe was the place that you went to to end up a day of shopping in Texarkana. 
I say this as a person who did not live in Texarkana, but on special occasion had an opportunity to come to Texarkana. You have to remember during that time, there was no McDonald's, there was no Burger King, there was no Kentucky Fried Chicken. There was just these mom and pop operations. But one that stood out on the Arkansas side was the Polar Bear Cafe. A typical day, you would come to Texarkana, spend time on Broad Street shopping. Right before you went home, you would go by Union Supply and buy those needed goods and essentials for the uh, kitchen. And then, to top off the day, you would pull into the Polar Bear Cafe where you could get their delicious hamburger and those greasy, greasy fries. They would put all of this in a brown paper bag and you knew you had the right mix because by the time you got home, the grease had soaked all the way through. <laughs> An institution that will forever live in the history of Texarkana is the Polar Bear Cafe. Booker T. Washington High School was a school in Texarkana, Arkansas, started in 1917. Now this all started when the Julius Rosewald Fund was established to contribute to the building of the school as well as other rural Negro schools. The facility was a two-story building, but school was only held on the first floor. There were 11th grades. Mr. C.A. Barrett was the first principal. He resigned after a year and Ms. Jetty Weaver was the next principal for three years. Interestingly, the school had no water and the students had to take turns going to the neighbor's well to get water. Eventually, with the next principal, Mr. G.R. Flanori, additional extracurricular activities evolved such as the drama club, choir club, and debate club. The band came shortly after. Other curricular activities included home economics, basketball club, and football. The sports program brought fame and recognition to the school as it was recognized statewide as one of the first black schools to have sports. The Booker T. Washington High School was consolidated into Arkansas High School in the fall of 1986. I, like I said, I was shocked. I had never heard of a situation where they had uh, a cemetery that uh, was segregated. Texas County was one of the first places where I'd ever seen this type of thing happen, but uh, it was interesting, to say the least, as to how they laid it out. And most of the time, in the beginning, that, that gate up there was always closed. And so you had to enter to get in this part. And this uh, cemetery is known as Woodlawn Cemetery. So it was State Line Cemetery on the other side and it was Woodlawn Cemetery on this side. The first time that I came out here to this cemetery was after the ice storm of 2000. And we came out here because as you can see, there's a lot of trees out here. and many limbs and bushes and stuff had just really destroyed this whole place. So they asked for volunteers to come out here to help clean it up. And when I arrived, I was it was interesting to see that they had this fence separating these two cemeteries. And I asked around, well, why is this? And I was told, well, the, on the other side, close to the state line, that was where the white citizens of Texarkana was buried. And then on this side, and I believe this is called Woodlawn Cemetery, this is where the African-American citizens were buried. And most of them were middle class folks because people don't realize uh, there was a business class of people in African-American communities in the 30s and 40s and 50s that were really doing well in Texarkana. They owned dry cleaners, they owned uh, filling stations, funeral homes, uh, grocery stores. Everything that a black person did, they purchased it from another black person. Therefore, their economy was striving. And there were a lot of people who were doing real, real well. 
And those are the families that you see buried in this uh, cemetery, per se. Those and a lot of war veterans. One of the most uh, well-known individuals that was buried out here is Silas Hunt. Silas Hunt graduated from the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And then he went on to enroll in the University of Arkansas Law School. And he was the first African American to enroll, but he wasn't the first African American to graduate because he had spent a while in the Army. And during his tour in the Army, he got shot and was left on the battlefield for three or four days in the cold. And he caught pneumonia and he never really got over it. So while he was attending law school at the University of Arkansas, he got sick and passed away. But he was the person who opened up all the doors and he's buried out here also. You see a lot of these with the little cross on it and that must be indicating that they were in the military because everyone that I saw with the little cross on it, uh, they were people who had uh, been in the military. That's the other thing you begin to notice when you look here, that uh, they filled it up from this part back. And so the uh, dates of the people who died, as you move closer and closer to the street, they turned out to be more recent types of individuals. You have folks from the 1800s buried here on the back, and you see some strange things that they were using as a headstone. But you see, this is one of the neatest things that I'd ever seen the way that, because you don't even see hot water tanks like that no more. But it was made out of good stuff because it has endured through over a hundred years, I would believe. But this is part of Texarkana history, a segregated cemetery. I hadn't ever seen that before in my life. But this too is one of the more well-kept secrets about Texarkana. Jones Funeral Home was founded in 1914 under John J. Jones Sr. Since 2010, it is also being called Jones Stewart Mortuary, ran by Jonathan W. Stewart Jr. He states that he averages 10 funerals a month, making this funeral home one of the most successful funeral homes in town. Stewart started off working for John J. Jones Jr. as the embalmer and funeral director. The funeral home closed its doors for a year until Stewart reopened the business himself. The current location at its second location, but the first was only across the street. It includes an upstairs chapel, parlors on the main level, with rooms specifically for embalming, prep work, and a casket room. Stewart prides himself on giving excellent funerals and arranging the music, even going to the hospital to arrange preparations for the family. He wants the service to be positive, uplifting, and memorable. His passion is why the funeral home still stands and is one of the most prominent businesses to this day. Jones Funeral Home has also received the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Acts of Kindness Business Award, giving in appreciation for hard work and dedication at keeping the dream alive in Texarkana, USA. Scott Joplin was an American pianist and composer born in 1868 right here in Texarkana, Texas. Even though he's known as our hometown hero, he is world renowned and globally recognized as the king of ragtime. Even though he had a brief career with his death in 1917, he composed over 100 original ragtime pieces 
He must have really been feeling himself after composing the piece you're hearing right now, Maple Leaf Ragtime, as he is documented as telling fellow composer Arthur Marshall, the Maple Leaf will make me the king of ragtime composers. This segment will highlight a couple of tributes made to Scott Joplin in our city of Texarkana. First, if you go to downtown Texarkana, the Arkansas side, and go to the intersection of West 3rd and Main Street on the south wall, you will find a mural dedicated to Scott Joplin. The mural was originally painted in 1984 in his honor, but it was completely restored in 2015. Also, our music department here at Texarkana College keeps the legacy of Scott Joplin alive by showcasing his ragtime compositions in different mediums of display. So, this is a player piano, which was a very popular household instrument in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And many great pieces of classical and modern music of that age became popular because people could purchase piano rolls of their favorite pieces. And we've got dozens of examples here. And then go home, pick up the roll, put the roll in the piano, and the motor here, start the motor, and here, some music. Now here, we're talking about Scott Joplin, uh, one of the great composers who came out of the Texarkana area in around the same time, the late 1800s, early 1900s. And Scott Joplin made his name, his fame, through publishing sheet music. Uh, great ragtime such as the maple leaf rag, the pineapple rag, and the entertainer rag. So back then people could access his music by purchasing sheet music and playing it, or purchasing a piano roll. And here I've got the piano roll of the entertainer. We put the roll, the roll canister here. We attach the roll here. We start the motor. And here we go. Scott Joplin, really a great Texarkana composer, uh, became a household name uh, in part due to player pianos and the roles of his ragtime pieces that were sold all over America and around the world. Scott Joplin, sir, on this Black History Month, year round and until the end of time, Texarkana and the rest of the world salutes you. Thank you.
be 